fellow poetry lovers and poetry curious. Today I want to introduce you to last year's, the 2023, um, Pulitzer winner. And that is Then, Then the War by Carl Phillips. And this, I think it's a subtitle, is Poems from 2007 to 2020. So his, um, Carl Phillips' first published book that I could see was in 1995. So what Then the War does is it kind of starts for him mid-career, so from 1995 to 2007. Um, it's only 12 years in. So it it actually starts, then the war, the book, then the war, actually starts with um, some current writing uh, or more recent writing. He might have another book out by now, I don't know. And then, and then goes backwards to a 2007, to 2007 poems, and then works its way up to current. It's not my favorite way to have, I mean, I can understand why a poet would put their most recent stuff first, but it, in order to understand the chronology, I actually had to go to his website and look what was there and try to map it out because I wasn't sure if he was starting with the most recent and then with his older work was again starting with the most recent and then going back but no he started with the most recent in other words new work that has not previously been published in book form and then he actually went back and did it chronologically from the earlier books to 2007 up to 2020. I prefer if they just go ahead and they start with the early work and then go up to their most recent and new new poems. Um, but anyway, this is the way they decide to do it for this book for whatever reason. Um, I actually read this. This is the first book, a long book of poetry. Well, I've read PDFs. I will say that, but I've never read what would technically be an ebook or digital book. But I read this on um, the app or website Everand, which was formerly Scribd. Um, I was happy to find it there. I was happy to find this and some other um, poetry that I'm interested in on this, on, on Everand. So I'm, I'm happy to discover that. And the subscription for it is eleven ninety nine. Um, is it? I'll say this: I have a wide monitor, and on this wide monitor, it seems to catch the line breaks um, pretty realistically. But when I read it on my tablet, which is a larger tablet, you know the line the line breaks get all messed up and so not so that you can't understand it but it will be more difficult for me to talk about line breaks or should I care to um, for any of these but, um, but overall I would say that my experience was positive I didn't feel like it disrupted me too much and so I will probably continue to use it because for eleven ninety nine a month, it's it's worth it to me. It saved me money on this book, and I'm only like a week into my subscription, and so I could easily potentially read three more books, if not more. Um, but I'm not trying to read vast amounts of books. Um, so even if I read just one a month, really, it would be worth it. So. Um, down in the description box, I'm going to include some links about Carl Phillips because this book did not contain much of a bio, very brief 
um, bio note about him. And there was no introduction to the book, um, which I thought was unfortunate. But again, you know, people make decisions uh, and that's what they did. <laughs> they had no introduction. Um, I also wish they had done it so that they could have introduced how the book was organized, but they didn't do that. And they had a very scanty bio, uh, but there is a list of his publications included. Um, but he is an African-American uh, gay man. I don't know how he identifies particularly, but he has won an award through the NAAC3. C3, <laughs> CP, and he has won a Lambda Award. Um, and it's pretty obvious in his writing that he is a man uh, who is attracted to other men. Is that, I would say this about that. It's about, you know, as you would with anything in, it has to do with people loving one another. It's about somebody wrestling with their, and I'm, I'm not saying with his, I mean, I don't know, but it didn't come across that way to me. Not that he's wrestling with being gay, but wrestling with intimacy, which is relatable, right? Regardless of what genders are involved, um, it's, it's relatable. So to me, that was not a... I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't sound nice to say it, but that was not important to me. <laughs> and I don't know how, because in his um, bio, he says nothing about his identity in those things. The reason I bring it up is because there may be people out there who are like, God, where's the poetry for gay men? Or where's the poetry for African-American gay men? Or where's... They may actually be seeking this out. Um, so here it is. So that's the really the only reason that, that I mention it, is for anybody who's looking for poetry um, from that position in the world. Here's Carl Phillips for you. Um, so other things just in general about the book. Um, And I'll read to you the books that are actually included. So this is one of those books of poetry because he is, how old is 64 or something? Where is it? 64. He is currently 64 years old. He could be writing poetry for another 20 years. We can hope so. But um, yeah. Since there's no, well, there's a scanty bio and a list of his publications. Um, but what this does is as many, when you get in the middle or towards the end of your career in poetry, if you've had a robust career in poetry, as Carl Phillips has, is that you create selections or you bring in selections from your previous work, and then you include some more recent works. So that's what he was doing, which is why I described earlier the whole, you know, putting the new stuff first and then going backwards and then going forwards. <laughs> um, and that what I'm going to do to you, do to you, do for you here in a moment is I'm going to read to you the books that he pulls from in this, in this to flesh out this book. Um, the back does have notes on some of the poems. Um, I didn't read them much because they weren't on the poems that I liked, that I particularly liked. I didn't see anything of substance on them. Um, and in the back there is a combined index of titles and first lines. So th those are kind of the features of the book. So let me get in here and read to you the, um, you're going to hear clicking because I'm 
clicking through the digital book. So we start with Then the War, and we have one, and then we have Among Trees, and two. I'm not 100% sure what that's all about. I guess that's section one for Then the War. I don't know if Among the Trees, I can't remember if that was a separate poem, but then we have two. And then, um, then we have the section that is Selected Poems 2007 to 2020. And it starts from the book, the previous publication, Speak Low, and then from previous publication, Double Shadow, then from Silver Chest, then from Reconnaissance, and next is Wild is the Wind, and then from the book Pale Colors in a Tall Field. And I don't know if this, because the formatting has it much smaller, there's, well, I don't know if it's a poem, but it's bolded, so I don't know if it's a poem or a section, it's star map with action figures. I recall from reading it, I think it was just a poem, so I'm not sure that it's bolded, or why it's bolded. So those are the books that um, are being pulled from. Let me see. So it looks like he may even have published since then. So that's 2007 to 2020, and I see um, on his personal website that he has a book uh, between Pale Colors and a Tall Field, the last one appearing in Then the War, and Then the War, he has something in between called My Trade is Mystery. Um, but that might not be poetry. Nope, it's not. It's Seven Meditations from a Life in Writing. Okay, fair enough. <clears throat> All right, so I marked, as I read through this, um, a total of six <clears throat> that I liked and thought I might read to you. Again, I wanted to narrow it down for the purposes of this kind of a, a video to uh, three. But I'm going to include down in the description box links to the first one that I'm going to read. And the last one that I'm going to read, the second one that I'm going to read to you, um, I could not find online. And then two others uh, that I found online. So of the six, there's five, um, well, there's four that I'm going to provide links for down in the description box. And one of them I'm going to read to you here um, that I couldn't find online. And... <laughs> which is totally, totally confusing. Um, but I'm going to read three to you. Two that I'm going to have links for, and one that I'm not going to have a link for. And I think I'm going to read the poems to you first, and then I'll talk about my general impressions. So let's do this. The first one is um, Blue Winged Warbler. And that is one of the way I'm understanding the format of the book. This is from among his newer poems in the book, as opposed to from a previously published book. So, do I have it here somewhere? I sure do. Um, so this is published in online in oxfordamerican.org magazine issue 113 summer 2021 <clears throat> and again it's titled blue winged warbler they say that deep in the interstices where dream and waking dream and what between the two i've called a life each crossing the other seem a nest of swords flashless as from long neglect, there's a meadow's worth left, still, of the aftergrass that grows 
in, that grows in sweeter once the first hay crops have been cut down. Just believe in it hard enough. Everything's findable, even now, they say, parallel, ascending. But that's not true, not true. So I'm going to read that last part. There's a meadow's worth left still of the aftergrass that grows in sweeter once the first hay crop's been cut down. Just believe in it hard enough. Everything's findable. Even now, they say, parallel ascending. But that's not true, not true. So I think that that's not true is everything's findable. So that's a brief, an example of a brief poem of his. But although he has like some sonnet length poems, it's more common that he um, has poems like the next one that I'm going to read you. Um, I need to find it within. within the um, digital book. And it is titled, The Grass Not Being Flesh, Nor Flesh the Grass. Like one of those moths, pa palpable just to look at, but as if weightless as dust, colorless as dust, landing on the sleeper's mouth in the dream of darkness. And then the dark for real. He came to me. Rest, I said, and for many years between love and a way of loving, for they are not the same. It is true he did rest. Fluttering moth, all the more attractive for the torn, the battered parts. As with the others before and since then, him turning, or sometimes I did, Birch leaves when, in a gust of storm, they'll show the side that's silver, in the same way that certain hard mistakes do, though less unexpectedly. Aren't they always fluttering? Rest, I say, each night, to each of them, and in the dream I'm resting. So by the time I'd read that twice, <clears throat> I started to wonder if the him, the him and he being referred to were even, I mean, it could be another person, uh, but if it could be parts of, of himself, parts of Carl Phillips, that makes as much sense to me within this context as, um, as it being another person. I think it, it works both ways. So silver is a not uncommon word to turn up in his poetry. I will just say that. And this dynamic of interaction with another is very common in his work that I've just read. I knew of Carl Phillips. I'm sure I've read his poetry in various collections over the years, but I have never focused on him. So this was certainly a way to get to know him. All right, so the last one that I'm going to read to you is Wake Up, and this one is longer. The road down from everything, even you had hardly dared to hope for, has its lonely stretches, yes, but it's hard to feel alone entirely. There's a river that runs beside it the whole way down, and there's an oversong that keeps the river company. I'm leaves, you're the wind. I used to think the song had to do with the leaves' confusion, the wind letting up 
They're mistaking this for something like courtesy on the wind's part, or even forgiveness. But leaves don't get confused. Silly to think it. And what can leaves know of courtesy, let alone forgiveness? What's forgiveness? Wake up, for the falconer has lost his falcon. He has heard that falcons are like memory. They come back. But not all memories do. Not all memories should. If anyone knows this, it's the falconer. How long ago that was. Yet all the varieties of good fortune he's come upon as a hand comes idly upon an orchard's windfalls. How different he's become since. None of it matters when the falconer steps back into memory as into a vast cathedral, which is to say, when he remembers. How cool it is inside the cathedral, and at first how dark. Soon, though, he can see a chapel set aside for prayers specifically to the virgin whose story he's always resisted. He sees a corner where people have lit candles, something for another's suffering, sometimes for another's suffering, sometimes for their own. He sees the altar that the falcon with the, he sees the altar with the falcon sitting on top of it. The weight of grief over what's lost versus the shadow of what's lost, forever struggling to return and failing. Who can say which is better? The falconer's eye meets the falcon's eye. I have a story, the falcon says, seems to, the wings lifting, the feathers rippling with the story's parts. I have a story I can't wait to tell you. So in this we have a falcon, and this is, um, well, it is closer to the current time. The more, the most, I would say the newer poems. This one is closer to the newer poems that appear in Then the War. And in Then the War, there's a lot of imagery for, of <clears throat> lions and hawks, it seemed to me, or it was notable to me at any rate. Um, and then there's another, should I call it a phase, um, when he was um, including a lot, and there's my cat, so I'm going to pause for a second. I'm not above chasing my cat away, and <laughs> she's deciding to be a pest, because she will, she will continue to yowl. Um, so, horses and waves, there's, there's a set of poems that as I was reading through it, and I didn't keep track of where. This is a problem with having a digital book. is It's just not nearly as easy, as far as I'm concerned, to flip back and forth with the table of contents. Keeping your hand in one place and looking back and, and that sort of thing. Um, but anyway, there's a section where there's a lot, where horses appear a lot and waves become significant. So and I'm just mentioning that because Maybe that's something you would find interesting. I don't know, but I'm mentioning it also because this particular poem, Wake Up, um, brings the falcon in. So as you read the book, if you read it from beginning to end, you start with those recent ones, and you, um, in other words, the, the ones that are brand new for the book, and you have hawks and lions showing up. That's what I'm seeing there. That's what I'm noticing. And then you have this gap where that kind of fades out and you don't see that. And then you have horses and waves and then you have wake up where here's the falcon again. So it makes it seem like there's a gap when in fact there's not a gap. <laughs> because since we're working as 
as we get later in page numbers, higher in page numbers, we're actually getting closer to what is in the very beginning of the book. <laughs> so could be there were falcons first, and then he started referring to hawks and lions, or maybe it was falcons too. I just made a note of them. Um, so my notes about what I was... I'm going to say my impressions. These are my impressions. I will preface it by saying I am very willing to say that I'm not philosophical enough, I'm not observant enough, whatever, to get certain things that maybe others would get. I'm, I'm not reading poetry to study poetry necessarily. I'm, I'm reading it for my enjoyment. <laughs> so... Some things I just notice and note and just keep reading, and other things can be a hitch for me. So one thing that I noticed right away, so even in the early um, part, which would be his most recent poetry, is that there's a lot of poetry about processing or positioning himself within intimate relationships and emphasizing kind of the push and pull of intimacy in general. And by that, I don't mean any innuendo, at least not intended by me. I have not reread poems to see whether or not there was an innuendo, inten innuendo intended by Phillips. Um, so, well, I won't make broad statements. Again, having, having read a book of poetry once through, to me, being who I am, is not enough to make too broad a statement. Um, so regret uh, strikes me as a frequent theme. Um, and I also noticed that the natural world, the natural world definitely appears in his poetry, but it is more often a backdrop for a meaningful event than something that is meaningful in itself. And of course, it can, it can be used for metaphor. The waves especially um, tended to be used for metaphor. If you want to see how he uses both horses and waves, check out that, the poem that I will have linked below called Monomoy. That's also a very interesting poem. Um, I personally often found his poems on the vague side or abstract side. Again, I don't know that that would be true. Well, the abstract would probably be true. Um, and some of his poems strike me as quite philosophical in intent. Um, in other words, playing with an idea or ideas, um, even expressing the relationship or the intimacy in terms of ideas as opposed to experiences. And for the most part, that is not um, my cup of tea in poetry. But it very well could be for others, which is part of the reason I mention it. So one of the links I'll have down in the description box will be to the Poetry Foundation um, entry for Carl Phillips. So you will then get with that, you will get to talk about him, like critical talk about him to get a feel for him. And then there's a, a fair selection of his poetry that you can read to get a feel for whether or not you want to read this book. So one of, one of the ways that I discovered that he is not the poet for me this is, and again, am I saying, you know, do I have anything 
against him as a poet. Do I have anything? Um, would I say that he shouldn't have run the Pulitzer? No, I wouldn't say any of that because, you know, really just going to the Pulitzer Prize and the three poems selected there, just a way for me to narrow down the books that I dabble in, the more current books that I dabble in. Again, because it's more philosophical, a lot of it could be um, the very reason that other people admire it and it doesn't work for me. But I will say this. In his phrasing, within his lines, within his sentences, in the way he thinks, in the way he expresses himself, he, he uses, and I can't remember the name of this, um, it's kind of equivocation, I guess. It comes across as hesitancy, like not wanting to say something directly, not wanting to say it and take a position on it. No, you're going to back up, you're going to do, I don't know what that's about. I don't find it um, I don't find that it advances the poem. It's like when of course most people probably don't know this when you're um, riding a horse uh, particularly English style and you're wanting it well, I'm going to use this example. You can check on the reins. In other words, you um, release and then pull a little bit and then release and then pull. Even pull is too strong of a word. In, you use that in order to slow the horse down or to collect the horse. But you can also do that if you're uncertain, like you're wanting the horse to slow down because you're uncertain and so you're checking it. I felt like I was constantly being checked as a reader. Oh, I just said this, but I'm going to take it back a little bit. I just said this, but I'm uncertain. It's like, this is me, right? This is partly my personality. It's like, just say a thing and commit to it. Um... And don't double back. I don't care if it's for philosophical purposes. I don't care. Just say the thing. So, but I think this is his voice. This is the way, I mean, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if he tends to talk this way. Um, but in any case, it's pretty strongly the way he expresses himself in, in poetry. And it was driving me crazy. I'll just say that. On top of that, it made me want to start editing his poems and rewriting his poems. And that's just a killer. <laughs> that's a killer. When I get into that mode with a poet, I should stay away from that poet. <laughs> I shouldn't. So when I'm triggered in that way, then to me, I can be, I'm on here and I usually am celebrating the poems, reading poems that I have enjoyed. Even ones that aren't technically, you know, quote-unquote good poems. They're not quote-unquote classy poems. They're not intellectual. They're not sophisticated or whatever, but I might just like them. And, and I'm not looking at them thinking, oh, you're, uh, you're an unsophisticated poem, and so I'm going to... I want to edit you. I have never figured out exactly what it is that that hits me with a poem. It's usually adding things that don't add anything to the poem. Makes me want to start shredding them, um, crossing things out, get rid of this, move this here. <laughs> and once I start doing that, that is... It, it irritates me that I want to do it. Let me put it that way. It irritates me. I, I at one point thought of having a channel that was Poetry Shredder, shredder because I can shred a poem and, and feel completely righteous doing it. But that's not what I want to do on this channel, and I don't know that that's really the way I want to spend my time. Um, I would rather read poetry, 
find things that I think are cool, interesting. And even if I don't, I don't go into poetry shredder mode when I don't understand a poem. A poem can completely charm me or mystify me or whatever, and I don't have any desire to rewrite it. So when I go into this rewrite the other person's poems, this very critical way of looking at things, that tells me that this is probably not the poem poet for me. Another thing that didn't work for me, so in the poem Wake Up that I read for you, I thought he did a good job of um, moving from one type of imagery into another type of imagery. And he even um, changes stanzas. So I can't even remember what was that imagery. We go from kind of the, the woodsy, we have the leaves, we have the falconer, um, and then we shift into the cathedral. So we're outside and then we shift to inside and we get to be a little bit more intensely about memory. So I feel like he handles all of that really well in this particular poem, which is why I read it for you. But I don't think that that's always the case, or at any rate not um, as I'm reading it. So I don't feel like the imagery in his poetry always hangs together well, or transmissions transitions from one into another well again anybody can point their finger at me and say well you just don't understand <laughs> why can't why can't you see this this is obvious and I would say well whatever I'm just talking about my impressions of this um, and I'm going to say too and this is in part I think because of that um, equivocating type of phrasing. That's the way I see it, is equivocating. There might be some deep philosophical reason for that that I'm completely ignorant of. Um, that that equivocating phrasing and some of the other things, and I'm not going to be very specific here, that starts to feel formulaic in the sense that I'm reading a new poem but it's like it's following a template. I feel like it's following a template. Maybe that's a better word than formulaic. And, oh, and now the neighbor is going to, um, <laughs> it's going to mow his lawn. Happily, I'm at the end of my notes anyway. So those are my thoughts on um, Then the War by Carl Phillips. I wouldn't discourage anybody from getting this book. Um, you know, check out, I mean, there's what I read to you. I'm leaving links to um, a couple of other poems that uh, I did not read to you. And the uh, Poetry Foundation has a bunch of his poetry, so you can read more of it and decide whether it's your thing. And now the mower is really revving up. So I'm going to let you go. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.